as Story Talks Back. Almost everything that we remember, think about, or imagine is a story. Stories entertain us, inform us, and even define us. They have upsides, and they have downsides. This podcast explores the power of story in every aspect of our lives. I'm Dave Stanton. Thank you for joining us. Laura Uplinger is an educator and lifelong student in the field of conscious preconception, prenatal, and perinatal parenting. Over more than 30 years, she has conducted workshops and presentations at conferences in Europe, North America, and South America. She served for 11 years on the board of directors of APPPAH, the Association for Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Currently, she is Vice President of Brazil's National Association for Prenatal Education, or ANEP. Uplinger received a degree in applied psychology from the Sorbonne and has been a student of the spiritual teachings of Omram Mikhail Ivanov for several decades. Well, Laura Uplinger, it's great to welcome you to the Story Talks Back. Thank you so much for your time today. Hello, Dave. It's a, my pleasure of being here with you. Great, great to see you and to talk to you. Uh, since our topic is always stories and storytelling, I, I'd like to start by asking you about stories and storytelling in your childhood and your growing up years. Was there any sort of uh, culture of storytelling or were there certain stories that really meant a lot to you when you were growing up? Um, funny you ask, when I was growing up, children were not a big thing. Um, I'm in my late 60s now. And um, remember that children should be seen and not heard. Yes. So I do remember in Bolivia, my parents were diplomats. I was conceived in Canada, born in the US. I learned how to speak in Bolivia. And I remember my first fairy tale book, Los Tres Pelos del Diablo, the three um, hairs of the devil. <laughs> it was horrible. I don't know who let that in my. Uh, uh, in my room and um, the nannies and the, the ladies who were working in the house. My parents were diplomats, always very busy. And um, I do remember though, a little later on when I was already in Brazil, um, between the age of four and six, falling in love with a very sad fairy tale, um, the little match girl. Mm. And um, she lights a match and she has, it's that flame will last the time of one of her dreams and then at the end she dies she will go back to her grandmother and it's christmas eve and people mm. on the other side of the window are having extraordinary meals um but no i wasn't told many stories i never knew there were stories to be told to children until i took a sweet revenge i became a mom and i was in the u.s and what a paradise, much more so than in Europe or South America. You can have in any bookstore, from the sublime to the ridicule, and the same shelf, fabulous, exquisite fairy tales with drawings, things from Japan and Tibet, or the, the Grimm's fairy tales, or Hans Christian Andersen. And my daughter, I did not know at the time she was going to become an, an actress, but she was already very intent in the telling of a story. We would finish a book, she was two years old. It was a, a little boy, a little tree, and a house, and a dog. So I had to make words for the story. And I would finish and she would say to me, who would you like to be? For her, any story would mean that we would be the story. So sometimes I was tired, I would be the tree, at least the tree doesn't have to go. <laughs> and I would ask her, no matter what I say, and she was so articulate and so tiny. But um, I must say that she's now in her 30s. But from the age of two, especially three when the fairy tale started, to the age of 13, I got double um, portions 
of all kinds of fairy tales and stories from the Appalachian Mountains and Beauty and the Beast from here and there. Oh my goodness. I got another childhood in me and she is an actress and she tells the stories. <laughs> I wonder if that, that story about the little match girl that touched you so much. Do you, do you have a sense of why that really touched you? Um, I always liked death. I have um, a son in the eighth house conjunct with Venus, which means eighth house in astrology is a place where death and transmutation. Mm. And I, I think it's so healthy, the death of a civilization, of a species, of an idea, because it means another one is coming. Mm. I'm, uh, I miss the future. This is very, very much common in the Aquarius crowd. There's something that, that um, beckons us, beckons us like, let's go there and there will be something else a new day will be rising mm. i would have never known this except that in our civilization people can't stand death will do everything to avoid even speaking about it if i ask you dave how will you die what do you think you say oh, it, it can oh no what a horrible thing and for me it has always been important being able to think about that my death death of loved ones, of other ones. Of course, I lost uh, friends at an early age. Uh, yes, but I can't see that as a tragedy. For me, the tragedy is not to live. Mm -hmm. And as coincidences would like, I am living now in a very old theater from the 19th century. The wall behind me didn't exist. This is a little house in a historical town by the sea in Sao Paulo state in Brazil. And it was in the route from Santos to Rio de Janeiro. And mm. it was normal to stop here. And I have drawings of this house in old times and a slave bringing in a chair because it was going to be a storytelling. We don't live without somebody telling us a story. That's the beauty of theater, the beauty of movies. Um, we need to think about who we are and by seeing something staged or in a story, we understand who we are. The story tells us about who we are and we understand the world through stories. I was a kind of a lonely child because it's not funny to live in Paris when you're seven years old and lots of studies. And, but I had the, the library of my father so I read The Little Prince and Voltaire and stuff that was not even from my age. I was nine and ten. You know, books are a part of who I am, really. Um, even a scientific book, to dive in and be with the author. Of course, I have the luxury of only reading what I want. So it can be fiction, it can be something on biography or history. But if it's well written, I feel I win, not only with the knowledge I gain, but the togetherness with an author. I know that every word, every sentence was, was carefully written and thought of. Mm -hmm. It's almost like music for me, the telling of a story. I wonder, you mentioned the idea that, um, you know, we don't exist without stories, you know. Um, I wonder if you could talk about, you know, your work in prenatal psychology and how you think stories relate to that. That's a great question. Um, when we have a little one, the age of two, three, if you want to spend a good moment of quiet, start telling them stories about when you were a baby, when you were in your mother's womb, when she or he was in your womb, and then there's this silence, this quality of attention that sometimes you don't think a little one can give. They want to know. They want to know again and again. They want to know more about what we know about them. The child can be adopted. The child can have had a difficult birth or a horrible um, pregnancy. It doesn't matter. Tell the story. The more we tell the story, the more sense it makes. And then I usually ask, the adults, those who are thinking about conceiving a child, to have a detective work and know 
get the stories from nine months prior to their conception, nine, ten months of the time in the womb, and nine months out of the womb. What was going on? Who was the president? What were the, um, the movies coming out? The political problems? Were the families, um, I don't know, friendly with each other or not? Did the parents know each other nine months prior to conceiving them? those stories that sometimes we hear from an aunt from a sibling from a parent those 27 months this is a very union concept they are kind of the luggage we carry with us for life suppose a person at the age of 50 is undergoing psychotherapy if that person knows those 27 months it's easy sometimes to pinpoint, ah, see, from here came this notion that you have about yourself. And as we are faithful to those 27 months and have a tendency to repeat that, it becomes almost like the, um, um, the soundtrack for our lives. The mm -hmm. story of those 27 months, starting nine months prior to conception, become a soundtrack and we are faithful to them a very anguished pregnancy the child in the womb receives those informations and organizes its neurophysiology accordingly according to a world that will be ah, i'm alone here and i'm afraid and this is a different cell setting than oh what a wonderful world Mm. Uh, let's see some friends this evening and watch sunrise tomorrow morning. This idea that the mother has of herself, of the world, and of the pregnancy, the baby incorporates it, but not just as a baby, incorporates of a, as a sense of self. So if you want to get into the kernel of self-esteem, see if this person was dreamt of, um, thought of before conception, invited, or as soon as pregnancy started, that person was welcome. Oh, I'm here with a sense that, yes, let life come. Life will be tough for everybody. But some will be more depressed. Others will show more enthusiasm. Of course, according to their own character and their own soul, probably. But a very important factor is how pregnancy was the story of a pregnancy stays with us forever and when comes a moment of hesitation of doubt i might report to what i learned in the womb in the, if i learned in the womb enthusiasm i said okay there must be a solution let's find a solution or if i learned despondency i'll end up with prozac do you feel that um you know you talked about whether the child was imagined or invited. Um, do you feel that the story of what the parents anticipated or what the parents dreamed of becomes part of the child? It's amazing, Dave. It's amazing how we are faithful to that story. Mm. It's an implicit memory, not an explicit memory. I can tell you what I bought this morning at the supermarket. It's implicit, but it's all over me and will dictate my, the functioning of my organs. Imagine a very stressful pregnancy, for whatever reason this it is. Already stress um, will allow for the blood to flow more into the limbs than in the axis, central axis, which means the uterus will have less blood. And then the baby receives that blood and has the same command to develop his limbs. There is a, a cell biologist, Bruce Lipton, there. He says, we have a great athlete later on. He will know how to run. But less money, less money, less, money, less, less wealth of blood was given to the brain and, and arteries and lungs and heart and pancreas and liver. And so by the age of 50, there will be lack of vitality in those organs. Hmm. Or blood should have been allotted to the to the normal um, um, 
to the development of the noble organs. Then the amniotic fluid, if the mother is too stressed, changes taste because the adrenaline and all these um, hormones of stress give it a bitter taste. And the swallowing is not so agreeable. Sometimes it even burns the, the throat, which means that the digestive tube will be less well formed than it should. And we see nowadays so many babies um, being born with an immature digestive system, you know, throwing up and, and parents so worried. We have worried so much over so many pregnancies. I'm talking about the pregnant women and pregnant families. I would see the medical um, staff having one mission and stress to pregnant women. If there is one problem, let's address the problem, but one at a time. You know, in England, they talk about antenatal scare instead of antenatal care. Because it's so tough to have to do so many exams and to have to wait so many days to see if everything is normal. When the doctor or the nurse could perfectly say that everything is fine. But, you know, for millennia, we've been expecting babies. What was it that made you so interested in this topic? What, what was it that made you think that this was something you had to explore? Um, it was in the 70s. I had just my, uh, I was finishing my studies in applied psychology. You know, the psychology that does subliminal uh, mm -hmm. propaganda. Um, uh, when you go and you ask something to a population, if they're against immigrants or not, there is a way to set those questionnaires depending on which answer you want. <laughs> it, it, it's a big lie. It's a, it's a complete lie. I studied that and I was not ready for that. Um, I said, no, I'm not going to do this. This was a, a big time, you know, the late 60s, the 70s. They went on full blown on that. So when I got my diploma, I, well, I gave it to my parents. <laughs> And I had done, I had been at the Sorbonne, I must say, those were great studies because I studied many other things, but that was the main subject. And I knew I was not going to use it. And in, as I think life took pity uh, on me and introduced me to a completely different psychology. I would call it esoteric psychology, a psychology where there was a soul, where there was um, a purpose to life, reincarnation, everything that was forbidden to think if you have a scientific mind. And I used to love science. I still do. And um, in this psychology, which was a little problem for me because I knew nothing about all that. And it's strange to find yourself in kindergarten when you had just graduated from, from college. But in that psychology, there was one tenet the power of the imagination of pregnant women. I thought this was so beautiful and realized in every tradition from the Andes to the Himalayas, from Laponia to Patagonia, Bretagne and Mongolia, there are quantities of legends in Africa, Tupi Guaranis here in Brazil, Indian, Brazilian Indians, Hopi Indians. There was always a special place for the pregnant woman and her mission as to the, the future, the, the child in her womb as a future adult. But science would say absolutely not. We're under genetic determinism. And somehow I loved it. This contradiction, like wisdom, ageless wisdom, and science not getting along. This was a time where cigarettes were welcome during pregnancy because then your child will be smaller and so the birth will be um, easier things like that i mean you know smoke camel and well and uh, i said well i don't mind spending a life backstage telling every pregnant woman i meet about her power because her imagination you know image imagination matrix magic it's mama matter we're giving the formation to the body of a child well and i thought that a hundred years from then science would discover because it was so so obvious 
I was wrong. 90 years, I was 90 years wrong. Because 10 years later came epigenetics. It's still at the beginning, but I, I caught it at the beginning. Epigenetics is something above genetics. It's a beautiful story to tell because we all have our genetic program established at the very onset, uh, at our conception. But the way this program is going to unfold will depend on the atmosphere the mother will bring. Her inner story about life will dictate how this genetic program will unfold. This is power, Dave. This is real power. We need to tell this story in every pregnancy. There's a future adult there in the waiting. And it's, an, it's a classroom. Never again the child will be as, as next to the mother, uh, like inside. I mean, the kid cannot take one weekend out uh, the womb. It's a constant formation, second by second. I mean, what a story. And we should, as a society, um, give extraordinary places for pregnant women to go because they only need three things. They need to eat well, they need to be inspired, and they need joy. Joy because of the oxytocin stuff. We can talk about three days uh, or more, but whatever, whatever a woman needs, but it boils down to that. Not too much stress, so joy, inspiration, something that inspires her, and food. Without food, let's not talk about brain or no baby. When do you think that, do you have a sense of when the, the template of the story, you know, which really kind of has a hero, it may have, you know, a villain. Um, do you think that that's something that's even present in the womb? Um, is there any way to know that or to, to think about it or discuss it? Like something as a villain happening during womb life? No, that the baby itself has a sense of, of a story, of a narrative. Yeah. The babies, there is a book that came out two years ago, two, three years ago, Babies Are Cosmic. There are other books like that too, but this one is a 20 year study of sentences the children say by the age of two when language is there till the age of four every child remembers remembers extraordinary things about the pregnancy sometimes conception it's more rare and many before being conceived you know that the, when the, the mom and, and and child they play i love you so much and then the child says, no no i love you more and then i love you more and the mommy says no i love you before you were born and then the child says i love you even before that <laughs> And I said, what are you saying? Yeah, I used to see you like this and crying and the child imitates the mother. And the mother had gone three years before conceiving the child, had gone through um, um, one of those uh, homes where you detox from alcohol and, and drugs and it's uh, heart wrenching and, and she would cry very often. And there was a table and she would cry on the table and uh, never when she touched the drug, never, never she would have told her child. So those stories that children tell, oh my goodness. And they are from all over the world. It's not something like, this is not scientific. Well, science is also empirical. Not one um, measles is, again, is like another measles. I mean, we each have different ways of living, even diseases, but you see, Children want parents to be strong and well and happy. When in the womb, they feel this, it's not so. They even try to match some of the stress hormones and send to the mother. It brings her a relief, um, what the child does, although the child shouldn't be doing that because this energy would be to grow his own body. Um, children sacrifice themselves willingly in the womb, energetically, physically, to help the mother. They even found um, cells from the baby in some wounds, uh, in some wound a mother had 
know the thighs, something deep in the, um, so a big cut. And in the healing process, there were some germ cells of the baby in there. So there's the communication comes from humoral, you see, the, our liquids, you know, the amniotic fluid. But you know, it hasn't been great to be a child on earth. Towards the end of um, the 20th century, Lloyd de Moss, a social scientist, created a new branch in history, psychohistory. They only studied in a, like, really like history, with all the simple details, not anthropology, but history, how children were treated from zero to 10, zero, including zero being the um, life in the womb. He created a, a journal and um, of psychohistory. I have here an article, The Fetal Origins of History, How the Dramas We Live in the Womb, dramas, big dramas. We are going to somehow try to repeat them through childhood and then finally understand who we are. And this would be one of the great origins of war. Um, if we want peace on earth, if we want great political lives for our nations, let's have a look at how we treat children from the womb till the age 10. There's a book that explains that quite well, um, Parenting for a Peaceful World, because Lloyd de Moss is not He's a great thinker, but not a very clear author. And Robin Grill was able to write the book that Lord the most wanted to write. He said, it's funny to see their correspondence. They would write to each other. And in 2006, this book came out. And Robin Grill is able to see how one by one, the countries in the Eastern Europe uh, part that had been communist, they one by one become a democracy but not at the same time, not with the same values. But if you look at the way they treated their children, it was a good forecast of when democracy would start. And um, so the story of who we were in the womb and in early childhood is, is paramount for the political, political future of a nation much more so than economical or political thinking and strategies, because it's the human being who will be a, a politician, who will be a great businessman, who will be an artist, who will be taking care of the culture. And with a good beginning, oh my goodness, we could blossom. And we have no example of nations like that throughout history. If you look at history through psychohistory, it's a holocaust of children. The um, parents have killed more children than, I mean, until the 19th century, the mode of uh, parenthood was assassination. And we carry that. And it's, I mean, we have the reports, we have women would have 10 children, five um, would thrive or not, but were killed. There was a patria podir, the power of the father in ancient Rome, a baby born out of, I mean, I did not want that baby at that moment for whatever reason. I could take that baby to a hill in ancient Rome and leave it, leave the baby to die of exposure, animals or, this was normal. It was in the law. Our stories with babies, with children, not so good. And then look at the elites. Um, how would people marry in the elites, governing elites throughout history? Usually the marriages were arranged. Pregnancy was not something fantastic. There was a huge fear of death at birth and uh, or the first year of the child, the death of the mother. But then when everything was, was fine, then would come breastfeeding moments. Uh-uh. A woman with a certain social status could not breastfeed. She had to have a wet nurse. The status quo said so. One king in France demanded that his wife 
could breastfeed. It was Louis IX, Louis IX. His wife was Marguerite de Provence. But leave one king. So if I'm, I'm a commodity, I, I'm, a, I'm a prince, okay, but I can see my mom once a day for a kiss in my forehead. So, and the one who's breastfeeding me cannot even sit at their table. So I'm a second class citizen. What, what's going on here? So this, these kids would grow up very well. They had enough food. Some of them had great studies. And then would come responsibility and power over the nation. But what was the main thing was aggression. Because can you imagine the amount of insecurity? If my own mother couldn't have me with her, I was not worthy of her attention and her time. So that's why history books are so tough to swallow. So many invasions, so much cruelty, so many strange stories. And can we change that? Of course. That's why I often say I'm a bearer of good news. We can change that trend. We don't need to suffer forever. Perhaps we think- won't. We won't have borders between countries. Sorry. Do you think that you know we can change behavior for the future? But do you also think that you know adults can rewrite the stories that form them? Yeah, this is a very important question. Yes, at any time. I mean, the present moment is more powerful than any other moment. Forget Mm. genealogy, forget karma, forget anything in womb life. If the person says, I am now in charge. But you see, that takes strength. And I love it when people do that. And of course it exists. And I hope that more and more people can do that. It's now everything depends on me. Okay, I have had all of this before. But now from now on, let's change the color of everything. So, I mean, are there certain techniques or certain uh, rituals that you feel are, are, are good at doing this? Um, what, what there is in our normal Western world, and even in Orient also, is the rebirthing. And there are many kinds of rebirthing. People who are taken back to their early childhood and womb life, or sometimes a previous lifetime, And they get this consciousness of what was then and can finally decide what they want to do now instead of repeating the same disease or the same weaknesses. This is one way. I've never undergone that kind of therapy, but I know it's very popular. Um, You know, when we meditate and we connect with our higher self or life purpose, and there's so many kinds of meditations just to dedicate some time to talk to the sublime, to talk to higher levels. You see, normal psychology speaks about the unconscious, the subconscious, the conscious level of understanding, but we don't see them speaking about the super consciousness, the consciousness would, that would take you in harmony with the universe, not just with yourself or, or your family or your ancestors or your body. And um, through that um, kind of contact with the spiritual dimensions of life, I'm not talking about religion, but some religious people have reached that level of spirituality. But it takes some studying, some, some open mind, because it's somehow against the status quo. It gives a lot of independence to the person, lots of agency. And apparently, The system would like us to depend on what the doctor says and what the lawyer says. We delegate to others, our children, ourselves, our bodies. I have to go for a checkup. But don't you know how you're feeling? Don't you know how your body is? So we are used to, as good citizens, um, not to have much contact with our deep self. I hope society can evolve very quickly. People won't need to be 
to work from nine to five in a job they don't like, for instance. That should be forbidden. Um, we, a day, so many hours, it's so important. Let's do what we love every day. You talked about, you know, personal agency and taking action. I mean, you know, as, as, as uh, in the womb, you know, and as children, we're receiving so many stories, so many inputs, you know, so many perspectives. How do we turn that around and become storytellers, having our own voice, um, having our own power? Do you have any idea? <laughs> how, would answer, how would you answer? I love the question, but how would you answer it? Uh, I would turn to art, Dave. I would like other lives to be portrayed in the screen and on stage and on songs. Um, I don't need to take away anything that already is, but there's so many subjects that are so fascinating and could be expressed in true works of art. Even the, the autobiography of Gandhi, it was a very good movie, of course. But when you read the book, behind everything we see in the, in the movie, there, there was thinking, and the thinking is not, giving, not given in the movie. Of course, they had to cut. I mean, <laughs> I understand um, a lot. But somehow, people are shy to tell about, in his autobiography, he wrote about his inner life and how he ended up choosing some attitudes and some ways of embracing life. And the movie is void of it. It's such a good movie, inspiring one, but we need more. And uh, I don't know, Magellan or Erasmus, um, people with extraordinary moments in, in politics and philosophy, and choices, because what I love about the, the storytelling is every choice takes you somewhere. They, Othello, okay, let's take jealousy, perfect. You, can, you want to take jealousy till the very end, look what happens with Desdemona, the very object of your love, you're gonna lose it. And um, it's, our stories need to be richer, wealthier. Mm -hmm. um, we should offer the little ones. I, I just finished with a friend a book about a, a little girl, four or five years old. She's by the sea, her mom is pregnant, and she, the little girl, tells us the story of what the mom does. And it's an adorable book for children, very well illustrated by um, an artist that paint some um, aquarelles like uh, the Waldorf style. So very subtle. And um, okay, this friend of mine is she's a writer for children's um, books. But what we didn't realize is that there are no other books like that. We were the other day in a live online and the woman, uh, the, the editor says, what other books tell about children telling about their mummies? And, and in other languages, they are not. See, we don't tell enough stories about the things that really matter. Somehow, we have started feeling at ease with superficiality. And it's a no-no for the soul. We need to be deep or very elevated. Um, superficiality kills the impulse for life. So vibrant teachers, it's fantastic. Vibrant parents for children. It's funny because then the class is silent when the teacher is vibrant. <laughs> you have a turmoil in the classroom, changes the teacher, comes a vibrant teacher. Every child is listening because there's something that has been transmitted. So how do we choose the teachers? How do we choose the doctors? How do we choose professionals? Perhaps we should change the, the entrance university exams, um, the SAT, how we select those who are going to be health professionals or professionals of, of studies, because I don't think we should apply formulas. 
we should protect life so that it can blossom better. I mean, when you to say that there were no other books on this subject, I mean, do you think that's because there's a certain taboo around talking about the pregnancy period and people don't know how to discuss it or think about it? For instance, if I ask you, when is your birthday? And you tell me, it's oh great month to be born. And we talk, oh, I had a friend with the same birthday. And if I ask you, Dave, and when were you conceived? Mm -hmm. What? What is Lord? I mean, it's almost gross. My parents are making love. I don't know. We never asked them. I could never talk. It's a big taboo. And whenever we have taboo, it's because it's something very interesting in there. If it weren't of great importance, it wouldn't be taboo. But ask your friends, how many know about their conception? Of course, some conceptions are so amazing that parents keep telling them to the children and then you were conceived that night. Oh, but we should be able to say when we were conceived. You know, for the um, in Hinduism, um, conception is a fractal that gets established. As I'm being conceived, I'll be gestated, I'll be born, I'll be breastfed, I'll live. Like the most important moment of our life would be our conception, that sparkle that, that happened, that embrace that allows for us to be here, the strongest force of all forces, which is a sexual force. With that, without that force, nobody's on earth. And we know practically nothing about it. So, and then comes in America, mainly, the pro-life, pro-choice. And uh, if you start giving a huge importance to the baby in the womb, then they think you want to forbid abortion. I don't think the state should legislate over anybody's body. But I also remember Al Gore in his first campaign with Clinton in the early 90s. He says, let's join forces and fight the unwanted pregnancy. I would kind of say, let's pro-life and pro-choice join forces and fight for the wanted pregnancy. Let's, let's go for pregnancies, pregnancies that are desired, that are dreamt of, that are, that are the expression of the will of the couple. But then we have to start talking about love during making love, which is another taboo. You know, sex, sexology came in, psychologists tell you about the importance of pleasure and knowing yourself and we don't talk about love like it's almost also a taboo look at big tv series how much love making is done with lots of alcohol with good ones uh, doctors and uh, and they literally start drinking and then they make love so let's take away consciousness but why why can't sexuality be the expression of love this seems so weird to speak like that but it is my hope that sexuality and love won't be divorced forever but of course not everybody does have a, a, a happy conception story and again how how do you come to terms with that how do you it's not it's not fair that that some people have beautiful stories and some have terrible I agree. stories i agree especially the tiny minority even unicef did a, a survey and not even 50 percent of people on earth would have been wanted before conception so it's big now uh, we have a t-shirt at APA, the association for prenatal and perinatal psychology and health and the t-shirt says it's never too late to have a good birth see the main ingredient dave would be consciousness i know that my conception was whew, absolutely not the best okay and then this and that and that and that happened but now i have to own it i am here and i can choose my again this the freedom of choosing who i want to be sometimes a big difficulty like that made me turn around and um, and be more ready for life than others without so many uh, that didn't have to confront such turmoil. But um, 
I do trust mothers. Um, they end up they end up being able to love in a way that also lets wisdom penetrate there. But the, the adult, by acknowledging, but having this consciousness of how difficult it was, first we cannot point fingers at because we were not in the situation of our parents or grandparents or whoever. So, but it's you would be surprised, David, surprised. Few people want to go and, and um, take themselves by the hand and see life differently, being aware of what happened and started to write a new present. It is possible, as possible as I'm saying it, but it's not very common. We suffer so well. We become accustomed to so many inner deficiencies and we sometimes prefer a pill or a consultation. See, we cannot ask anybody to come and help us to be who we are. It's like, you cannot help me to eat some fruit by eating the fruit yourself. It's, I need to be able to eat it myself. And this is part of initiation. This is part of communion, partaking communion with life. Nature is of great help. So many people have found um, a way to be more, more whole as they relate to beauty and nature. Do you feel like you have made peace with your conception and, and gestation story? Many aspects of many, most of the aspects of my life in the womb were kind of beautiful because, and, and then the marriage didn't work so well. They had 60 years under certain aspects that were just miserable. But the best time of my mother's mind was when she finally had married that man and was pregnant. It was New York in the 50s. And um, for her, everything was possible. Okay, it was not the boy she was expecting because um, it would have been good to give her man uh, a little boy. But six years later, they were in Brazil and she was pregnant again with my brother. And the pregnancy was very difficult. Many things happened. She felt kind of abandoned. And my brother is brilliant. We are great friends, but he's often just a mess psychologically. Okay, his mind is good, he's a diplomat, but his, um, his heart is not into it. And um, um, I never was the first of my class and never was a great student, but happiness was the, you know, the, the main decor of who I was. My resilience is certainly much higher than his. I remember being upset for something just for a moment for him it would take days and he was three see how resilience is when something disturbs you how long will it take for you to come back to the way you right you know, yeah so just because i was gestated and the sign of enthusiasm gave me an extraordinary it didn't resolve my laziness and several of my aspects of my character, but at least it gave me some, yes, let's go for it. And that is priceless. I'm almost 70. And boy, life has been fantastic. I mean, I, when I think about the whole conversation, you know, I think about in the womb, you, you don't have motion. You don't have a lot of, like you said, you can't get out and walk around. Um, so you really are very much receiving, you know, you're doing, but you're receiving in a lot of ways. And it seems like you need to become the hero of your own story, you know, once you're here, once you've all had all these inputs, um, you need to become a hero for yourself. You say it very well, the hero of your own story. Um, as I was working with pregnancy, 
my mother was visiting in Brazil, it was in the early 80s. And um, I asked her, Mom, when you were expecting me, were you also expecting an adult? Because I would often talk about that with the lady, especially in high risk pregnancy in a hospital. And she says, oh, yes, of course. That's all oh, interesting. And what did you wish for me? Oh, if you were a girl, I wished this and that and that. I wanted you to be like so and so. Ah, and if I were a boy, oh, if you were a boy, I would have one of those qualities and you would be more like so and so. The two people I just love very much. But then they looked at her as mom. I've done that all my life. And you always complained. Says, yes, I exaggerated, she said. So I realized that if the mom wants somebody independent and this and that, no matter how many times she will try to undo it after birth, it stays. And mm -hmm. I did not know. I was 26 when I was asking her this and already had a hope to, to look and say, but mom, you always complained that it was this and exactly the qualities she had wished for me. So see, Dave, one of the main things would be for moms and dads to expect an adult. At least it gives more hoof, not just a little baby. Expect the toddler, the rascal, the teenager, and expect an adult. Not saying I want my child to be a pianist one day, no. but he can have great sense of music. You see, you the qualities you and your wife most admire, wish that for this um, future adult. It, it's a good start. It's a very good start. Conception with love, expecting an adult, in three generations, we can start closing prisons, we can start closing psychiatric hospitals. For me, these two, prisons and psychiatric hospitals, are the big shameful dimensions of our societies. We should be amazing, and in many ways we are, but while there are prisons and psychiatric hospitals, we're doing something very wrong to our children if they grow up to be such misfits instead of being the creative misfit mm. they are they're behind bars i mean this is so sad and we are all responsible for it as a society as a culture or politics i i think we should face that responsibility let's mind the well-being of pregnant women let's give them singing and acting let's give them sewing and walking and fountains and flowers let's make a huge effort every dollar will see i have a friend who says let's invest in infant structure <laughs> boy that you will have so many benefits there's a, a one of the best books on this whole subject we're um, talking about today is from marcy axness parenting for peace just in that book, you see the amount of effort. It came out in 2013, I think. And um, so it's still this century, but it's a wealth of, um, of thinking from so many uh, specialists and poets too, and spiritualists, because in a society, the spiritual dimension, the scientific dimension, they have to go hand in hand. Um, with the artistic dimension also, art, spirituality, and science, it's one unit. And um, usually there's always one despising the other. Why? Um, there is a big flag of, for peace that has a circle, a white flag with a red circle, and in the center, three little balls, really red, expressing that. Nikola Hurich was a Russian painter. He lived in Nepal for many years. And the UNESCO adopted his uh, Madonna of Peace because of that flag of peace. Mm -hmm. And um, spirituality, art, and science, hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I, I can almost touch this. It's coming, you know. It's possible. We're still away from it. But it's dawning. That age is dawning. It's been beautiful speaking to you. I really so appreciate your time and uh, learned so much from you. So thank you. 
I would have loved to hear from you also, Dave. I'm sure you have plenty of ideas on those subjects. <laughs> no, I just want to hear yours. Well, thank you. Well, have a great, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. All the best. The Story Talks Back is produced and hosted by Dave Stanton. The music you're hearing now was written and performed by Christopher Daydream. The theme music at the beginning of our show is an excerpt from Play by Merlin Twelfthoven, performed by Carlos Quartet as part of their 50 for the Future series. Please subscribe to the Story Talks Back on Podbean and check us out on Instagram. See you next time.